Hello, everybody. You had a good lunch? <coughs> Time to sleep? <laughs> okay, let's talk a bit about pgstat.io. Um, that's me. We can skip this. If you want to know anything, just ask me. Yeah? Same here. We skip the marketing stuff. We have a booth outside. If you want to know anything about us, just go to the booth. Huh? So that's it for the marketing. So who of you does not know pgstat statements? Everybody knows that? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> don't panic, you're not in the wrong session. It's still about pgstat.io, but there's something which you by default cannot find in pgstat statements, and it's the same story for pgstat.io. The reason I'm asking is this. In the default configuration, you will not see any statistics, or it's actually it's zero, for the I.O. timings. You have four columns, the, the read time, write time, and the same for the temp stuff, and they will be zero. So nothing will be recorded there. You can easily verify this. If you didn't change the default, nothing which helps you in that. The reason is this one. So track I.O. timing by default is off. I don't know why it's still the case, but it seems to be, or the reason seemed to be performance related. Huh? So how can you test this? Any idea? Sorry? Yes, but somehow you need, you need figures. Huh? It should give you an idea if it's okay to turn it on or to keep it off. Exactly. So there is a utility which is called PG test timing. This gives you exactly the information you need. The funny thing is, um, when you look at those numbers, you get something like this. This is pretty easy to understand. So this tells you how many calls are less than one microsecond, two microseconds, and so on. But there's also another number, which is this one. And I have talked to many people this morning, including Bruce and Peter and Vibor, and nobody could explain me how this loop time, which is nanoseconds, relates to the microseconds below. I've seen Alvaro, maybe he can answer that. So nobody seems to know that. I don't know either. The important part is, what you need to look at is, is this. In the, in the blue box. So in the documentation, you can find if most of your calls, I think the number is 90%, are less than one microsecond, then it's safe to turn it on. I personally have never seen a system where it's not safe to turn it on. So I don't know why it's still off by default. So this is the sentence from the documentation. Huh? Good. Going further. How does this relate to pgstat.io? And as I said previously, when you look at pgstat.io, you will see the exact same situation as you have it in pgstat statements. By default, all those metrics will be zero. So nothing you can get out of this if you don't turn track IO timing to on. So now we can start. First one we will look at is extends. You heard about that before? This is one of the metrics you will find in pgstat.io. So before we look at extents, let's look at how Postgres is organizing the files on disk. By default, if you don't change it at compilation time, Postgres uses a segment size of one gigabyte. That means a data file grows up until to one gigabyte, and then you get the next one. This is the default. If you look at how it looks on disk, so if the left thing is your PG data, then you have a base directory. Under the base directory, you find some numbers, which are the so-called OIDs, which are also directories. And in the directories itself, you will find your data files, which again are OIDs, and OIDs are object identifiers. So far, so good. 
Good, there's a small utility you can use, which is called OID to name. This translates those numbers to names so that you know where you are. And if you go and create an empty table, look at the disk, we will see an empty table will not consume any space on disk. It's zero bytes. Good, to start from scratch and to get any meaningful results, you should reset the statistics so if you start to measure something. For this, you can call pg-start-reset shared with the parameter IO. This will reset all the IO-related statistics in your cluster. Good, you can a bit, you, what, what you can reset is statistics for Biggie Writer, for Archiver, for IO, that's what we just did, for wall-related stuff and also for the recovery prefetch. A new thing with Postgres 17 is, if you call that function without any parameter, it will reset all that stuff at once which can be quite helpful. So what happens if we insert one row into that tiny table? What you will see if you look on the disk, the size of the file increased to exactly eight kilobytes. And eight kilobytes is the default block size of Postgres. Again, if you didn't change it at compilation time. So when we ask pgs.io, please show us the number of extents we did. We will exactly see the same. One extent, the opbytes means the eight kilobyte default block size. Okay. Any questions so far? All clear. Good, the meaning of those columns are the backend type is exactly the same as in pgs.activity client, backend, whatever. The object is a relation or a temporary relation. The context can either be normal, which is related to shared buffers, it can be vacuum related, or bulk read and bulk write. And then the extents you already know gives you the number of how many extents happened since you reset the statistics. So let's generate some more data. Extend that a bit. And what we will see, we got eight extent, and this file size is 40,000 something bytes. No question on this one? Eight multiplied by 8K is 40,000 something? Doesn't matter. So where do these other extents come from? Any idea? Exactly. So we don't have only the data files. So that was supposed to be the question. We also have the free space map. And if vacuum did something, we also have the visibility map. And those also need to be extended. And so just keep in mind, it's not only the data files which need extends. It's also those other two files you can have per table, which is the free space map and the visibility map. Okay, why or what, what does this metric tell you? If you combine the extend time with the track IO timing, also if you turn that on, this gives you an idea of how much time was spent in extending your files on disk. This is what these metrics are telling you. Is this important to know? That was a question, by the way. <laughs> so what is it good for? In a long running cluster, when you have much more extents than writes, what does this mean? Or what could that mean? Sorry? Yes. Yes, th this could give you a hint that vacuum is not able to catch up. Mm? Because if you have many extents and less writes, a write means write into existing data files without extending them. Mm? So when you see many, many extents and less writes, this might mean that vacuum is not able to catch up. And then you need to know where to look at. Mm, tuning vacuum on specific tables or whatever you need. 
Any questions to extend? No? Then let's talk about evictions. What is an eviction? So this is a very simplified picture of how it looks when you have a running Postgres instance. On top you have the Postgres cache, which is defined by shared buffers. Below that there is the OS with the file system cache, and then you have the disks, of course. So what happens if the cache is full and Postgres needs to make new room for new blocks to be loaded from disk? or from the OS cache. What happens then? Can you speak a bit louder? And kicking out blocks out of the shared buffer. This is exactly what evictions are about. So how does that work? Postgres internally uses a so-called clock sweep algorithm. So imagine the, the circle is the shared buffer and you have a lot of blocks in that shared buffers and the numbers are the usage counts. So how many times a block was used? Red means the buffer is currently pinned, so someone is currently using it. Clock sweep means, okay, go through the circle, do a minus one, and the first one which goes to zero, kick out. Okay, pretty simple, but it works. If you go to the source code, there's a really good readme on the source backend storage buffer, which exactly describes how this clock sweep is working. So if you want to go for more details, have a look there. Good. Summary, what does an eviction mean? When the Postgres cache is full and there needs to be new data loaded, blocks which have not been used, or which fall through the clock sweep algorithm and get out of the cache. Okay? Except when they are pinned. Then of course not. So evictions are also tracked in pgstat.io. There's another column which gives you this metric. To simulate that, you need to know, of course, how large is your shared buffer. So in the Linux default configuration, that's 128 megabyte. So if you want to see any evictions, we need to force Postgres to kick out blocks out of the cache. Okay? How could we do that? Or well, before we do it, let's use PG buffer cache. That's another extension. And look or check what we currently have in the cache. So these 60,000 something blocks, that's exactly the 128 megabyte, which are configured for shared buffers. Okay, so that matches. When we look at the usage count, the same we have seen in the circles, only 422 are currently used. So we need to fill the remaining one with some data. So uh, here, another statement, if you want to look inside the cache, you can also join that, and then you see the human readable names of the relations which are currently in the cache. Huh? This also gives you an idea of your hot objects. So let's try to force some evictions. We could use pgbench, you probably know that, to populate the database with some sample schema. Why don't we see any evictions? Nobody has an idea? More than 128 megabyte. I didn't get it, sorry. But still Postgres needs to load the data somehow. I think, I don't know, I'm not sure about this one. What I know is when you load 
huge relations, or when you touch a lot of data, Postgres internally uses a so-called ring buffer. This, you can think about this as a protection for the other users using the system, because if this protection would not be in place, someone could completely load the cache, which forces Postgres to drop out all the other stuff, so performance for the other people will go down. So in this case, a ring buffer is used, and you see on the lower part of the screen, that's 256 kilobyte when the relation is more than one fourth, and 60 megabyte for the other operations. So this is not, yes? This? There's no parameter. In the, in the source code? Yeah. Yes, as far as I know. And for the other, for the copy and so on, maybe that's what, what you just said, the ring buffer is 60 megabyte, you know, just to protect the others. So how can we force evictions? There's another ext an extension we can use for this, which is called PG Prevorm. Prevorm means preloading the relation either in the OS cache or in the Postgres cache. And if, if we do it like this for the PG Bench accounts table, which is the big one, then we will see that a lot of evictions, uh, a lot of evictions happened when we do it like this. So 150,000 for the client backend and a few others because Autobarkroom also started to do some work. Okay. So again, same question, what is this metric good for? When you see a high number of evictions, this could mean that your shared buffers is too small. Kicking blocks out of the cache all the time probably means increased shared buffers. This is what this metric can tell you. What is a high number? When you reset the statistics and then you start to move. But, but you know the size of your cache. And then, then you start monitoring this, this metric. And if, if this goes up quite, quite high and quite fast, and then probably you need to increase the cache. Any other question? I think you need experience with your application to really just listen. Anything else? Good. That was evictions. Next one. Hits. And this should be pretty clear what a hit is. Same picture here as before. When you request something which is already in the cache, of course, Postgres can use that without loading it from disk. This is what a hit is. Pretty simple. No my slide hangs. Sorry for this. No.
So now we're back. Sorry for this. So hits means a requested buffer could be buffer could be found in the cache. So there is no real need for I/O, and Postgres can directly give that back to the to the application. The more hits you see, of course, this means the less I/O you will see on your system. Huh? So this means that the cache is probably sized in, in a good way. If you look at the hits, hits can be in several contexts. It can not only be in context normal, it can already be in context vacuum or all this bulk stuff. And this gives you an idea how your cache behaves when it's, when it's warm. Of course, when the instance is just started, the numbers will be low if you reset the statistics, otherwise they will increase. So what does bulk mean? Bulk means certain large IO operations are done outside of shared buffers. That's the same what we've seen before. And those numbers show up in the bulk read and the bulk write columns. <coughs> so if you want to monitor this, again, reset the statistics. And then you can see the, the hits for the normal sessions. And if you want to simulate the numbers growing up, so what you can do, you can touch all the same buffers um, during, during a, a time. You can simulate that with watch. So that doing the count star will touch all the same buffers all the time. And in another session, you can monitor how these hits will go up. And this gives you an idea how, how the hits evolve. Good, what is this metric good for? A high number of hits compared to a low number of evictions tells you, okay, my cache is probably okay. If it's the other way around, it tells you the other way. Good, next one is F-Syncs. F-Sync is clear. This is another metric which is, which is tracked in pg.io, but before we look at this, we look at what is an F-Sync really. If you look at the wall-related stuff, when you do a commit, of course, Postgres needs to make sure that the data reaches the disk. So there's an F-Sync, which means go down to disk. But F-Syncs are not only here, F-Syncs are also there. They are just not immediately. So the check pointer and the BG writer periodically also write down all the modified or the dirty pages to disk. And when this is happening, there also needs to be F-Sync at the end. One important thing to notice, F-Things are only tracked in context normal. You will not see them in the other contexts. So this is what the metric will tell you. If you see a high number of F-Things, maybe the check pointer is not configured in the correct way. Or again, shared buffers is not configured in the correct way for the load you have in your database. Good, there are some other metrics. Um, we don't have time to look at them in detail, but you have them here. You have the reads and the read time. Again, the timing um, is only enabled when you do track IO timing on. You have writebacks and you have the reuses. And I think in Postgres 17, there's even more stuff coming up. So this is all the metrics which pgs.io provide you. Good, last but not least, there is a concept which is called direct I.O. And Postgres 16 comes with something in that direction, but as a developer option. What is direct I.O.? Or in other words, how is Postgres working with the I.O. as of today? The problem with this approach is that you can have double buffering. So a buffer can be in the Postgres cache, but it also can be in the OS cache. Direct I.O. means open the files in a way that we bypass the OS cache. Oracle, for, for example, is doing that since ages. And Postgres is relying on the OS cache. So the goal of Direct I.O. is to bypass this orange block completely or as far as possible. Currently, or this, this is how you can control it. As I said, it's a developer option. That's why it's called debug underscore IO direct. And then you can control in which areas you want to see the direct IO, either for the data files 
or for the wall files or for the initialization for the wall files or all of them. If you turn that on, what happens? Um, Postgres is asking the kernel when it's Linux to, to open the files with odirect. When it's macOS, it's F no cache. And then Windows, it's a pretty long name, file flag no buffering, so that you get the benefits of direct I.O. If you want to test this, this is pretty easy. By default, it's off. So create a workload you want to test, once without direct I.O. <coughs> and in the second try, you enable direct I.O., then you have to restart, of course. Do the same test, and then you can see for your workload, is it giving you any benefits? or is it slowing down your operations? Okay. <coughs> so I'm almost done, except for two things. How many time do I have left? Oh, 50 minutes, okay. First of all, I want to thank all those people for developing that stuff. And there went a lot of work going in, so it's Melanie, it's Samai, I don't know how to pronounce that, and all the reviewers, because I think this pg.io gives you a lot of good metrics which have been not there before. And you really can use them to troubleshoot your, your system when it comes to IO-related statistics. Another thing, if you want to visit Munich in April, there will be PGConf DE. It's not so far away from Prague. Um, also with tracks in English and then some in German. So we would be happy to welcome you there as well. So that's it from my side. Now we have more than 10 minutes for questions, I think. Questions? One question. So did you do some testing with the direct IO and what are your impression about the, the pro and cons and uh, the results uh, you obtained? Also all I did in that direction was PG bench benchmarks and for all the tests I did, but this is a VM on my notebook and that's not a real server or something, actually the direct IO was faster than, than the default configuration. Five to ten percent, but in the documentation there's there's a warning. Huh? So usually, it's, also I think there's really the sentence: it's expected to slow things down right now. Hello, I just wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned, of course, that all the statistics we get are dependent on the workload we have. But do you think that there's some kind of general, let's say, alert threshold that we should monitor, uh, like in by default something like this? mentioning that some uh, evictions, for example, can go too high or something. Do, do you think that is this worth alerting by default or everything is, let's say, workload specific and we just need to <coughs> dig deep only if we have some kind of problem? I, I think, first of all, you need to reset the stuff. Huh? If you have a long running instance, I don't think these, these numbers are meaningful at all. Mm -hmm. So it's probably hard to set up an automatic alerting on this. But if, if you think you have a problem in, in one of those areas, I think the best way is reset and then monitor and then, then see what's the result. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, regarding the direct I.O., did you increase the shared buffers when you... No. Okay. So you'll have to see. No. Same configuration. When other, otherwise, the test would be somehow useless. Huh? Any other questions? It's great, thank you very much.